This week on Go Chuck Yourself, we're talking about Season 4, Episode 15, Chuck vs. the Cat Squad. That's right, and to celebrate, we have a special greeting from our own feline intern, Archie. Archie, take it away. Meow, meow, meow. Aaron, I have a question, and I want you to answer it honestly, okay? Okay. Mm-hmm. Was that Archie, or was that just you making a cat noise? Much like this episode of Chuck, we are also dealing with a sense of distrust and skepticism because I don't really feel like I got an answer from Aaron here about that that introduction right there. I, I will give you another chance, Aaron, to uh, let clear the air before we start this fantastic episode of Go Chuck Yourself. Was that your cat, Archie, or was that just you going mew, mew, mew? That was... I, I, can't, I, I just can't believe that you would ask me that. I just can't believe you don't trust me after we've been through four seasons of this show together. You, you saw me. You were looking at me over Zoom. Did I look like I was meowing into a microphone? Is that really something you think I would do? You know I don't watch you while we record. I don't make <laughs> eye contact with you. I stare at the wall and just talk unabridged about my thoughts about Chuck. That's true. That is, I can confirm that because I am looking at you. Okay, well, (laughs) I uh, will continue looking at the wall. Hello, my name is Chris Gillespie. Thank you for tuning in today to go check yourself. My name is Aaron Arada. I'm also grateful that you are here. This episode might be about the Cat Squad, but I'd like to start things off by checking in with the GCY Squad. Ah! That's right. It's time for a visit to the old GCY mailbag. We got some fan letters to read to share oh my god uh while i get this queued up aaron do you want to tell the nice people at home how they can submit their own letters to us if they'd like yes please email us at go check yourself podcast at gmail.com you can also uh follow us on twitter or and or message us tweet at us at go chuck podcast on twitter and also instagram that's right definitely do it because we love hearing from you and it's fun we love hearing from you yes so we have two individuals here who reached out to us uh, via email. Um, we first have a letter from our friend uh, Gulal S. Hi, Gulal. Um, Hi, Gulal. I hope you're doing well. Um, Gulal had reached out because um, Gulal wanted us to let us know that our episode, our recent episode, Chuck versus the Balcony, that we did. Um, so I guess that was like season four, episode 11, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. wasn't on Spotify. What? Just wouldn't wouldn't publish on Spotify. Why wasn't it there? Chris, you're in charge of this. Uh, <laughs> there were there were older episodes and there were newer episodes. However, mm-hmm. this particular one would not post on Spotify. So obviously I take uh, all of this very seriously. So I reached out to Spotify and I also <laughs> reached out to our uh, podcasting platform, the, the site that manages our RSS feed, which is Podbean, and was trying to figure out where the issue was. And wouldn't you know, both Spotify and Podbean said that they were not causing any problems. They were both like, well, we looked into it on our end and we're fine. And I said, well, that's what the other people said. And they're like, well, we're fine. So I was like, well, there's obviously an issue somewhere. Um, And so we did not get it resolved. I tried, uh, Gulal. I've already written back to you and let you know that I tried and I gave you some some other options for how you could find the episode. It is on Apple Podcasts. It's also on Google Podcasts, uh, as well as Podbean's own site. Um, Could potentially be on YouTube. Um, There's some other sites, too. So I apologize to our Spotify listeners if you were looking for Chuck versus the Balcony and you could not find it. Spotify stopped responding to my emails and Podbean (laughs) seems to think that everything's wrapped up. So we are laying it to bed. Um, But Galal would also like to say uh, they write, thank you both for such a wonderful podcast. Really glad I found it. Oh, that's really nice. So thank you so much for your kind words and for bringing that to our attention. Yes, that was awesome, because I um, although I monitor a lot of things in the Go Check Yourself universe, I wasn't really looking at Spotify at all. So I did not notice. So I appreciate it. And I hope that you continue to 
uh, listen to the show. And if you're another listener and you notice something along those lines that you want to reach out to us about, feel free to do so. Um, very, very prompt. And I'm very courteous. So I would love to hear from you. Our other letter that we have here today is from Jeff S. Hello, Jeff. Oh, I uh, I was a little nervous before you said Jeff S. Uh, maybe Jeff Barnes. Is that his last name? Jeffrey Barnes. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Oh, yeah. So it's uh, not it's not him, though. It's not. It's not. Okay. Uh, Jeff S. is retired, uh, wow. but he's also a musician. Uh, wow. And he hasn't been. Okay, able- well, he is kind of sounding like Jeff Barnes so far. <laughs> uh, he is originally from the Los Angeles area. So okay. maybe this is Jeff Barnes. Um, no, it's not. I have it on good authority that this is not Jeff Barnes. Okay, all right. Continue. Uh, so he's retired. He's a musician, but he hasn't been able to do any gigs because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's had a lot of spare time on his hands. And so he started watching Chuck, which he came across Mm -hmm. on uh, Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeff writes, I found your podcast the other day and have totally enjoyed it almost as much as watching Chuck episodes. I accidentally accidentally came across Chuck on my Amazon Prime feed in late June of this year. Since that time, I am now finishing up my 12th time through the series. Oh, my gosh, Jeff, that's amazing. (laughs) My wife thinks I'm crazy, but I have one motivation. I am madly infatuated with Yvonne Strahovski. <laughs> I've watched most everything she has appeared in, and Chuck is by far the best. So, got a another Yvonne Strahovski fan. Uh, got some competition. Yeah, I, I suppose that's true. Um, I she's a, a, a huge talent and is a um, I think you know part of the appeal of the show and the longevity yes, of the show was that they had her. Um, so. In addition to watching Chuck multiple times through, Jeff has been binge listening to our show. Oh, wow. (laughs) He just started listening to us uh, relatively recently and uh, just emailed us again yesterday saying that he's all caught up with us in real time. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I guess his next step will be to listen to our catalog 12 times. (laughs) uh he's please don't do that jeff don't put yourself through that but thank you so much (laughs) he's undergone a project where he logs how often characters say certain pieces of dialogue in the show um and he sent his findings to us so i thought that i would pull those up um for us to review it's actually it's very interesting oh this is amazing so he has he's been working on the entire series Uh right now we have we're looking at the the season one log of pieces of dialogue that he breaks down by the saying and then the number of times that it said and then also who said it. Mm -hmm. Um, So according to Jeff, the most uttered piece of dialogue in season one is awesome, which is said 18 times by Mm -hmm. Devin, Chuck, Sarah and Ellie, Um, followed by awesome is stay in the car um, and variations of stay in the car. Mm-hmm. That is said by Sarah and Casey 17 times. Mm-hmm. Um, people just saying Chuck is the the runner up is the third place with 13 times. People say mm-hmm. Chuck makes sense. Uh, shortly thereafter, followed by Chuck. Are you OK? Uh, which is said 10 times specifically by Sarah. And then also, I'm sorry, uh, appears eight times. Chuck, Sarah, and then also uh, characters Laszlo and Lou say that. A lot so, of people saying I'm sorry on Chuck. Yes, I was obviously looking out for lines that we pick up on a lot which Mm -hmm. is uh it's complicated yeah of course it's complicated i was looking for that too (laughs) it's complicated it's only said five times uh apparently in season one and it's only said by chuck which is interesting that makes sense um i think i like to assume that it picks up in subsequent seasons and then we also have don't freak out which i thought would appear more but it only appears four times and it's said by sarah and chuck that's, um, I mean, that's still a decent amount of times because season true. one is relatively short. That's true. Um, so then we also have the season two findings, which more episodes. So there's more instances of dialogue. Uh-huh. Uh, this time, I'm sorry, has <laughs> broken from the pack and has taken <laughs> first place with 36 instances. Chuck, Sarah, Ellie, Jill and Lester saying I'm mm-hmm. sorry. Okay. Awesome falls to number two. Uh, or actually, no, I'm sorry. Awesome and I'm sorry are tied for first with 36. Um, a lot of awesome. Chuck is still up there with 29. Uh, trust me, or in variations of people asking to be trusted or with uh, 20 sayings. Uh, people are very courteous in Chuck. They say thank you 18 times <laughs> in season two. Uh, and then there's some other instances of did you flash on something? Uh, stay in the car. 
are like 16, 17 and 16 instances. Um, are you okay? Kind of makes up the next bulk with 15 and 14 instances. So then it's complicated. Um, where's it? Do they? Is that even on the list? It is. It's way. They only say it twice in season two. Wow. Oh, and do you see what the very last item on this list is? <laughs> Don't freak out. See, so you were giving me all this crap that I didn't remember it as the catchphrase. Maybe I was just thinking of season two where it's only said once. <laughs> it is only said once, according to Jeff. Um, so I guess don't freak out is no more special than these other uh, singular lines in season two, which is Chuck is vital to our national security friends. I think we Chuck should break. Seems to be um, what's your favorite band appears on both season one and season two, as said by Chuck. So uh, we do know that he is obsessed with Sarah's favorite band. It's true. Aces Charles Aces also appears um, both on both lists from yes. uh, each season. So that's really interesting. Um, Jeff, thank you for sending that in. He's currently working on, I think, on the subsequent seasons. So okay. uh, Jeff, I'm really excited to see them. <laughs> if you want to send those along, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, no pun intended, I guess. And <laughs> then uh, Jeff also wanted us to to know that he actually is from Hollywood. He was born in Hollywood. He grew up in the San Fernando Valley and he actually worked as a messenger for a film production company. Wow. So he delivered items to the Warner Brothers studio. Mm -hmm. So he used to drive all around the back lot, which means that he now recognizes most of the settings from Chuck that they filmed oh, on the back amazing. lot, which is crazy. Um, he's also very familiar with locations around LA as a mm -hmm. uh, Angelino. Uh, mm -hmm. and so he knows when Chuck is filmed on location, he recognizes things. And he even, this is the craziest part to me. I can't believe this. I This must have been so crazy for you, Jeff, when you like saw this for the first time. Um, but apparently he grew up going to the, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, Marin store, um, which was the store at Fallbrook Square. Fallbrook Square is where the Buy More is. What? Marin's was the store that they used for the Buy More facade. Oh my God, so that's he, amazing. He literally grew up going to the Buy More. That is crazy. <laughs> um, and he says that he totally enjoys our podcast. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for reaching out and for sharing all this with us. That's really special. And um, we're very glad that you like our show and that you like Chuck. Um, so I... Thank you so much, Jeff. That's amazing. So speaking of locations that may or may not be back lots, um, this episode has a couple. Does does take place partially, at least in uh, Rio. A very very uh, definite definitely is Rio. No doubt about that. I trust it. <laughs> no expense was spared to fly the entire cast and crew to Rio de Janeiro for this <laughs> during scene. Carnival. During Carnival. During Carnival, it's the time to go. If you haven't been to Rio, <laughs> course, highly yeah. recommend. <laughs> yes. So this is one of the episodes I texted you about. This, Chris. I remember this episode pretty vividly. But the opening scene, like, still caught me off guard. I knew, I knew what it was. And I was just like, I had to pause it. I just like stared at my screen for a little while because it was, it was a lot. I really don't think I can do it justice describing it, but I am going to try. Um, it's, it's a Charlie's Angels reference, right? Is that what they're going for? Uh, yes. And it was also okay. blended with allegedly the heart to heart. Um... They love heart to heart on this show. <laughs> yes. Always talking about it. So it opens with an extended fantasy sequence where a male voiceover is describing a group of female spies that he manages known as the clandestine attack team or the cat squad. It's made up of cold hearted Karina, Zandra, the bitch, Amy, the party girl and his pride and joy, Sarah Walker. I'm not sure why Sarah doesn't get like a cool descriptor and also why her last name is given. That kind of seems like doxing, but that's fine. <laughs> um, I also feel like cold hearted and the bitch are pretty similar descriptions. And I thought the guy could have been a little more creative, but I don't know. More power to him, I guess. I feel like there's kind of a steep escalation between cold hearted and then to bitch because <laughs> I was just like, ah, yeah, Karina, the cold hearted and then Xander, the bitch. I was like, whoa, that's kind of that's got a little punch to it. huh? Yeah, yeah, it does. So it turns out that this is an actual fantasy sequence being had by Morgan after hearing about the Cat Squad from Chuck. Also, while they're talking about this, they're walking by a big Hello Kitty display at the Buy More. So I thought that was a nice touch. I don't know if you noticed. That is a nice touch. I also just wanted to point out that um, I don't know if you saw something that our old Chuck expert, Alan Seppenwald, once wrote uh, where he pointed out that 
the this is similar to how they opened Chuck versus the role models, which was season three's first episode or or one of the first episodes after the weird non season finale finale in season uh-huh. three. This was mm-hmm. how. The, and so they're opening again with a heart to heart slash Charlie's Angels fantasy sequence in Morgan's head in the, the same way that they did in season that's three. That's really interesting. That's a good point. Maybe that's like a well that they come to when they have like extra time to fill. Seems like it. Uh, another Chuck expert that had a little comment to say about the sequence was Seth, who asked, what happened to Sarah's wig? So that was nice. It was nice to remember the black wig of old. So glad it's gone. <laughs> Chuck goes on to say that he wants to get in touch with the old cat squad so Sarah will have some of her own friends there at her and Chuck's engagement party. He asked Sarah for her input, but she's a little reluctant to offer any guest suggestions since she doesn't have many friends or family, so Chuck says he's nudging her. I'm sure that won't blow up in his face at all. Chuck asks Morgan if he has a way of contacting Karina, since as you remember, Karina and Morgan got nasty a few seasons ago. Morgan is a little worried about the prospect of having Karina and his new girlfriend Alex in a room together, but eventually he concedes and gives Chuck Karina's contact information. Chuck sends Karina like... Like a mobile invitation that just says, like, Cat Squad is invited to Chuck and Sarah's engagement party. It doesn't say, like, hi or how are you. It's just, like, a photoshopped image and not even a good photoshopped image. So if it's not a text message, do you think it was, like, a calendar event that he just, like, sent her her (laughs) eye calendar? That's kind of what he did. I guess so, yeah. It's a bold move. I didn't know people did that. I know. Maybe we should start. (laughs) Instead of saying, like, hey, Happy New Year. Would you like to get dinner? Or, hey, Aaron, would you like to record this podcast on Sunday? You could just uh, send me a calendar invitation. It's going to wake up in the middle of the night to your phone vibrating with me just sending (laughs) you calendar invites. Yeah, exactly. His, His text does do the trick, whatever it is. Karina receives it while kicking major ass on some sort of mission and immediately calls Amy to ask how to track Zondra down. So the next scene had me feeling kind of like weird, like it it felt kind of unusual, but I was happy about it and I couldn't figure out why until the end. So let's see if you slash our listeners can hazard a guess. Sarah comes into the courtyard and runs into Ellie, who says they're leaving the baby with their in-laws for the night. She asks about the engagement party and Sarah admits that inviting old friends and family is a little complicated for her, but Chuck has just been diving right in. Ellie says if Sarah ever needs to talk about anything, she'd be happy to listen. Sarah says it feels good to talk. Okay, so do you know why this scene is weird? Because they said it's complicated? No, they did say it's complicated. Um, that's I, a freebie, Jeff. Write that down. I, that's a, Yeah, write that down. Um, this is the first scene I can remember where two women are talking to each other alone about something other than Chuck. I mean, really? Chuck's kind of related. <laughs> but, like, they, they talk a little bit about themselves for, like, more than, like, a second. <laughs> Oh, Christ, you're right. <laughs> it was really like, I was like, why does this feel so good and weird? <laughs> There's not a lot of women talking to other women. It happens in this episode quite a That's bit. That's true, it though, does. Right? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. oh, God. Well, <laughs> the, it's only... The se- most feminist episode is the Cat Squad. In their defense, they're only on season four, episode 15. They basically just started the series. <laughs> That's true. So Sarah heads home and Chuck is in the middle of preparing a whole spread of like appetizers and cocktails and stuff. She asks if they're expecting company and he says, no, you are. He explains about the cat squad and Sarah is understandably a bit nervous, thinking seeing them again might open old wounds and bring back old feelings. Before they have much of a chance to discuss this, a helicopter flies directly over the courtyard, someone shouting for Sarah Walker over a megaphone. They run outside with Morgan in tow, just as Karina, Zandra, and Amy rappel down from the helicopter. They say they're taking Sarah out for a girl's night and will have her back by noon the next day. Also, Karina checks out Morgan and says there's something different about him. I don't know why he doesn't mention Alex at this point. I guess he either doesn't have time or doesn't want to hurt her feelings, but he doesn't bring up his girlfriend. I'm sure that won't be a problem either. After the credits, Chuck wakes up beside Sarah. I guess she got home a little bit early, but she is still dressed from a night at the club. She says that going out with the cat squad was fun, but she's a little wary because there's a bit of bad blood, if you will. Apparently on their last mission together, the target kept anticipating their moves and Sarah found a bug in Zandra's boot. The CIA cleared all this as a misunderstanding, but the cat squad still don't really trust one another. Also, the cat squad slept in the living room overnight, all except for Karina, who is nowhere to be found. Where is she? Oh, she's naked in Morgan's bed, of course. 
He wakes up and he's a little alarmed to find her there. He scrambles out as she deduces that the thing that's different about him is that he's having regular sex. She tries to seduce him by pulling off the sheet and showing off her naked body, but he hisses and runs out right into Alex. Oh no, this is quite a pickle. <laughs> he ushers Alex outside, realizing they were supposed to meet for breakfast. He apologizes for having to reschedule, but says he's been helping Chuck with Sarah's old friends. Alex seems to be understanding, at least until Karina opens the door and is a little bit handsy with Morgan. This creates all kinds of awkwardness. Morgan pushes Karina away and says he'll meet Alex for lunch the next day. Alex says she trusts him. At breakfast with the cat squad, Chuck prompts the cat squad into a bit of reminiscing. Amy, who seems super sweet, brings up how close Sarah and Zandra used to be. Sarah and Zandra share a little bit of a moment. Meanwhile, Karina is apparently trying to play footsies with Morgan under the table, so he runs off into the kitchen. The cats say it's time for them to catch flights out of town. Once they're gone, Chuck says that he thinks it's good Sarah's reconnecting with her old friends. She says she's just glad their time together is over. But as Zandra and Amy are getting on a motorcycle and Karina is heading towards her car, the car explodes! Karina is okay, but a piece of the bomb is embedded in her leg. She pulls it out, making Chuck flash on someone named Augusto Gaez. Chuck asks the girls who Augusto is. We cut to Beckman explaining that Gaez was the enemy of the cat squad and the leader of something called the Gentle Hand. They guessed that he thought the cats were reuniting and staged an attack to stop them once and for all. Since he attacked on American soil, Beckman gives the cats the go-ahead to go to Rio during Carnival, no less, and take him down. Chuck and Casey will be shadowing the cats, minus Karina, who will be monitoring from Castle due to her injury. Sarah seems a little reluctant about all of this, and so is Morgan, because he has to keep an eye on Karina. Sarah storms out of the room and Chuck follows her. Sarah tells him, that the last time they went after Gaia's was when she found the hidden transmitter in Xandra's shoe. Chuck reminds her that Xandra was cleared by the government, but Sarah is still skeptical. We cut to Rio, where Gaia's is standing at a party. He receives a phone call from a modified voice that tells him that the cat squad is headed for Rio, to which Gaia says, excellent, the plan is working perfectly. As the extended Team Bartowski prepares for their mission. Chuck pitches an idea to Sarah. He suggests that while Sarah is in the field with Amy and Zandra, he can dig through all of the CIA's files on the cat squad and Gaia's, and if they find anything suspicious, he, they can arrest Zandra while they're arresting Gaia's. If Zandra's innocent, on the other hand, then there's no problem. Chuck thinks that this would be a good way for Sarah to engage with her past and have an emotionally corrective experience, and Sarah reluctantly agrees. Xandra walks up at this point and starts to instigate trouble with Sarah, telling her to stay out of her suitcase. Xandra and Sarah seem like they're going to go at each other, so Casey breaks it up. Morgan arrives in Castle, and Casey tells him that he's been assigned Castle duty to help Karina in case she needs anything because she's immobilized by her, her injuries. Morgan tries to explain that he doesn't feel comfortable left being left alone with Karina, but Casey tells him to get over it. Interesting, like, you'd think that Morgan would be able to talk to Casey about feeling like there's, because of his relationship with Casey's daughter, that he feels extra uncomfortable with Karina. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, it's a little bit, Casey's feelings about the whole thing are a little bit uh, confusing, but I think, based on uh, what happens later in the episode, Casey is just, like, dealing with his own problems right now. True. Xandra then poses the question to the group at large of how they're going to inf infiltrate Guys' location, to which Amy replies, Guys, it's a party! Cut to Rio. That was a pretty good Amy impression. Thank you. You know what I really wish, and it wouldn't make any sense, but I'm just going to throw it out here. You want me to do my Adam Driver impression? I mean, if you want to do that, sure, go ahead. That wasn't what I was going to say, but... Hello, Aaron. You chose the dark side. I did choose the dark side. Um, anyway, I, I, Nicole Richie in the cat squad, wouldn't that be kind of cool? It doesn't really make sense because she was like, she was bad <laughs> and like the enemy, but I, I feel like I wish it was happening. I wish she could be at Chuck and Sarah's wedding. You think they're going to invite her? Uh, I don't she know. She was kind of important to their relationship. Kind of. Yeah, I guess it wouldn't really make sense for her to be in the cat squad because she was actively working for Fulcrum and at no <laughs> point worked with Sarah. So, yeah. okay. I, yeah, seems like she would have been in this episode, but she's not. We cut to Rio, where Carnival is in full swing. Sarah, Amy, and Xandra arrive at Gaius's party, but Xandra says that Gaius won't show up until later. They decide to split up, with Xandra going in one direction and Amy and Sarah going in another. 
Sarah is wearing a necklace that apparently has a micro camera in it that is sending footage back to Casey and Chuck who are in the van. Casey's watching the footage while Chuck reviews the Cat Squad CIA files like he said he would. Casey tells Chuck that the CIA has been over those documents hundreds of times and they couldn't find anything conclusive. Chuck tells Casey that he thinks he's onto something and that they can prove Xander's innocence. And Casey tells him that he also used to be like Chuck, wanting to fix things for other people. But then he recounts his failure to reconnect with Kathleen in the last episode. uh, (laughs) And apparently it's really bothering him. Yeah, apparently it is. Uh, Back at the party, Gaez has finally arrived. Xander spots him immediately and starts to close in. Sarah points out that Gaius is heading into the VIP room in the back of the club and that Chuck and Casey can retrieve the blue, the building's blueprints uh, so they can get the layout and meet them back there. Back in Castle, Morgan presents Karina with what appears to be a hummus plate. He says that he's only there to tend to her most immediate needs, which he has now met with the hummus platter. So he starts to exit. Karina says that her needs have not been met and Karina apologizes for never calling Morgan back after their last fling. Morgan says that he's over her and then tells Karina about Alex. Karina asks if he's told Alex that he loves her yet, and he says no, but that he intends to. So Karina takes this to mean that Morgan's relationship isn't as serious as he thinks it is, and she draws him close uh, with her cane, which is something that she has. <laughs> yeah, she has a cane. <laughs> Just like a, you know, a cane. I think this uh, is the first time it appears, so it's appropriate that you describe it that way. Yes. She's using her cane to pull Morgan close like some kind of sexually aggressive elderly woman. <laughs> Uh, or like uh, when they use a cane to like pull somebody off stage when they're doing a bad job. True. Uh, Morgan gets a phone call from Alex and remembers that he's supposed to be meeting her at the Biomore so they can go to dinner or lunch or I don't remember exactly. But Karina won't let Morgan leave per orders from Beckman. So Morgan takes the call and tells Alex that he has to cancel again because he's stuck babysitting an injured agent. Alex is disappointed since this is the second time Morgan has canceled on her uh, just this episode alone. But Morgan insists that he'll make it up to her. Morgan makes a lot of kissy sounds on the phone, at which point Beckman pops up on the screen and tells him <laughs> that there's a problem in Rio. Back in Rio, the cat squad take out the guards protecting Guys' VIP section. They draw their weapons and enter. Karina calls Chuck and Casey to let them know that the NSA picked up a call that got placed from Burbank to Guys uh, yesterday, meaning that Guys knows the cat squad is coming. And sure enough, armed guards swarm around the cat squad, cornering them and outnumbering them. Gaius walks out from around the corner and says, it's been a long time, cats. Drop your weapons or die. We cut to a commercial break, but when we return, Gaius has Sarah, Amy, and Xander tied up to uh, three chairs surrounded by guards. Gaius monologues about how it's a shame that they've been trying to fight him for so many years. Sarah says that he's the bad guy, but Gaius says, not necessarily. He wants to work together with the cat squad. Turns out that this whole night was just a setup so that Gaius could offer the cat squad a job with a gentle hand. Honestly, someone just, like, offered me a job out of the blue. I mean, I guess, like, getting kidnapped would be no picnic, but, like, I'm just I'm just putting it out there. If, like, someone wants to offer me a job, go ahead. With the gentle hand? I mean, I mean we're, we're not really clear on what the gentle hand does. They are, like, arms dealers, so I don't really want to, like, work in that kind of environment, but, like, maybe they have, like, a marketing department, social media or something. Here's a thought. Do you think that the gentle hand worked with the ring because rings go on ah, hands? I'm sure that they did. And then that hand used a lever as a fulcrum. Ah, wow. You're breaking this wide open. To raise a flag that said Volokov Industries. And and if there were a lot of hands, they were kind of like hydras. Hydras are more like heads. So although Aaron would accept this job offer, uh, the cat squad and Sarah are not really interested in it. Uh, it's actually really actually not even up for discussion since Gaia says that he'll kill the cat squad if they don't <laughs> take the job offer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As this is happening, Chuck and Casey are sneaking their way into the building. Casey threw the party itself and Chuck on top of the roof. Chuck plans on breaking down into the VIP area from a window in the ceiling. But Casey says that Chuck's just overcompensating. Turns out that uh, the scene between Sarah and Ellie wasn't the only instance of the glass ceiling shattering today. (laughs) Uh, Sarah asks Gaez why he doesn't let Xandra finish the sales pitch for the gentle hand. Xandra is offended and asks Sarah why she doesn't just accuse her outright instead of saying it behind her back. Amy tries to be the peacekeeper here, but Sarah and Xandra aren't having it. Guys is amused by all of this and suggests that maybe the traitor is Amy or Sarah. Sarah says that he knows it's not her. So if he's going to kill her, she may as well tell her the truth uh, about who the traitor is. Guys says that he'd rather just kill her. So he draws his weapon on Sarah. But Sarah's been cutting through uh, her wrist ties this entire time. So she stands up, punches the gun away and points her knife at Guys's neck. Guys tells Sarah to keep it cool. 
and uh, he's about to tell her the name of the traitor when Chuck falls through the weakest glass window in the world. Chuck is just like barely presses up against this glass and it shatters into a million pieces. It's probably like it's made out of the same material of the window that Casey fell through a couple episodes ago. Exactly. So since Chuck already attached himself to a repelling line, he dangles from the ceiling like a pinata. He flashes on target <laughs> practice and uses his trank gun, trank gun to take out guys as men. Um, while Sarah takes out guys as other men with close quarter combat, guys starts to escape. But Casey immediately catches him in the hallway. Sarah runs up to Chuck and tells him that now that he's already been arrested, guys will never tell them the name of the mole. Chuck tries to apologize, but Sarah shouts at Chuck that she doesn't need help with her job or coping with her past. She cuts Chuck loose and he falls to the floor. Back in Castle, Beckman congratulates Team Bartowski on a mission mostly well done. Beckman confirms that there is a traitor in the cat squad and that they need to figure out who it is. Uh, Casey is tasked with interrogating Gaia's while Sarah tells Chuck that she has a job for him. So... If it's definitely not Sarah, we could confidently say it's not Sarah. So it means it's either Zandra or Amy. So yeah. you think that there would be more of a focus on pressuring these two individuals and trying to figure out who it is. Uh. But there's really not. They they don't really they seem like it's unfathomable. They don't know how they could possibly <laughs> figure out how they would figure out the who the traitor is. For what it's worth, Zandra repeatedly says that she's not the traitor. Just putting that out there, I mean, we'll discuss this more in a minute, but they seem like there's a huge oversight going on. Back up in the buy more, Morgan is waiting around rather nervously with flowers and a box of chocolate. Alex walks in and Morgan tries to tell her about the date he planned, but Alex immediately sees Karina's lipstick on his collar. Morgan is incredulous and says that it's not what it looks like and that Karina uh, did it just to mess with him. The, the lipstick stain is very thick. It seems like yes. her lips mm -hmm. must have been like coated. <laughs> with lipstick like a a fine modernist painting of you know of from the i know. have a question this is like a trope and something that we like talk about of like lipstick on the collar means that a man is cheating on you but how how does it get there like is it like she's kissing his neck like do enough <laughs> enough women are doing that like like, ooh, I just love kissing your face. Let me kiss the shirt collar, too. Yeah, like, I don't know. I'm not saying that, like, neck kissing is weird, but it's just, like, how does that happen so often that it's become a trope? Or is it just, like, something that, like, TV decided was a thing, like, men wearing heart-shaped boxers whenever, like, their pants get ripped? Like, it's just a thing that's on TV, and we all just know what it means. Oh, like, no, th that one's totally true. That's that's absolutely... <laughs> okay, that's thank definitely you for real. confirming. Yeah, no problem. The other thing I want to ask here is... Do you think, like, Morgan is actually caught between a rock and a hard place, or do you think he could just explain? Like, I guess he would have to say Karina is his ex, but I feel like Alex is a an adult woman. I feel like he could just tell her. Right, and I think to the same point, like, Alex, something that I forgot about while watching this episode is that Alex knows about all the spy stuff, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So if he was just like, look, there's this other spy that Sarah used to work with. She's crazy. She's, like, messing with me to get, like... Yeah. It's I'm sorry that this is happening, but like I yeah. she's bullying me, basically. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think Alex probably would have been receptive to that, but yeah. he doesn't really ever articulate it No, because he doesn't. He thinks that Alex is going to be all upset that there's another woman that he had like a one night stand with. Yeah. So uh, as Sarah walks Chuck out of Castle, she tells him that she wants him to go through their belongings to see if anyone planted any bugs on their stuff. And because uh, the bugs might follow them back into the apartment. Chuck knows that Sarah is trying to keep him away from the cat squad, so he hands her his findings from his deep dive into the CIA's files. Sarah can't believe that Chuck is still trying to help and tells him to stop and then ejects him from the castle. Xandra appears down below and says that she's tired of dancing around all their drama. She's ready to settle their beef once and for all. And Sarah says, yeah, let's do it. And then we finally have a sexy Sarah showdown. Woo! It's very formal, and they're wearing kickboxing attire, so it's not like a pure Sexy Sarah showdown, yeah. which is usually you know, in the moment and usually... Uh, but they're brawling, and they're in yeah, Cassie's they tr training room. Uh, still a showdown. Meanwhile, Casey enters Gaia's holding cell with Amy. Gaia asks why Amy's there, and Casey says that she's there for muscle. And That's Amy pretty cute. whacks Gaia's across the face. Casey says, shall we begin? Casey's being all intimidating while Amy beats the shit out of Gaia's. Eventually, they end up standing against the uh, two-way mirror while Casey is kind of, like, looking at Gaius with his arms crossed, asking questions of him, and Amy is standing next to Casey looking in a compact mirror. 
Casey asks if Amy is going to primp all day, and she turns towards him and blows powder in his face, and he immediately passes out. Amy was the bad one? Who could have seen this coming? Who could have seen this coming? I was actually, I was irritated that, like, Gaia's even, like, proposed that Amy was, like, bad. Um, Because I just feel like the way this episode was going, they were just like... It could never be Amy. She's too sweet. <laughs> yeah, Chuck literally says that at some point where yeah. he says that no, she's too bubbly, I guess. Yeah. So meanwhile, Sarah and Zandra are fighting. Zandra reveals she wasn't in Milan for the mission in question. Sarah wasn't there either because an anonymous call told her to stay in Paris. Since Karina was in the U.S., according to Chuck's file, that leaves Amy. Apparently, uh, while they're discovering this, they don't notice that Amy has come into the room and, like, picked up some weapons. But she knocks them both down. She explains that she switched sides so she wouldn't have to fight crime in stupid, sexed-up costumes anymore. And honestly, that's, like, kind of fair. I mean... Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, Yeah, girl boss. She asks Sarah to join her, but Sarah refuses. Amy points out that she knows where Sarah and her loved ones live, so if Sarah ever comes after Amy or Gaia's, there will be hell to pay. Later, Chuck runs into Ellie in the courtyard. He asks if she would have been disappointed not to have friends or family at her wedding, and she says yes, but maybe Sarah sees the world differently. Ellie gives Chuck actually genuinely sound advice that instead of trying to fix things, maybe he should just take a step back and listen to Sarah. Chuck agrees. So I have a question here. When Chuck bumps into Ellie in the courtyard, he's moving six suitcases, presumably three of his own and three of Sarah's. His job was to search through their like their luggage to find any bugs. Why isn't he just doing that in the apartment already? Oh, is that what he was doing? I didn't. I wasn't okay. really clear. It's, I thought he was just like bringing their luggage so they could leave. That doesn't really make sense either, though. Yeah, they, they're going to leave on the night of their engagement party. This was OK. I thought this was very confusing because I was like, yeah. why is he doing this? Yeah. But I guess Sarah meant don't unpack our stuff in the apartment. So he's bringing the stuff back to Castle to unpack, even though if you think you have like a tracker or something in the Mm -hmm. suitcase, it's going to be active Mm -hmm. whether or not it's in or outside of the suitcase. The suitcase was already in the apartment. So if someone was trying to figure out the apartment, like where Chuck lives, they already Mm -hmm. did that. So moving the suitcase, not adding anything. I was very perplexed by this. I don't I don't know. Like he's carrying luggage and that was kind of like that's all. That's all you need to know, and that's all that really happens with it in the episode. Like, he doesn't, like, use it in a fight or anything, so it's not really relevant. He's just holding stuff. That's all you need to know. True. It's true. So we cut back to Castle, where Morgan and Karina finally have it out. Morgan calls out Karina for all her bullying behavior, and he finally admits that he is in love with Alex, and he does want to tell her. Karina kind of apologizes for misreading the situation, but she's like, she seems like she's a little proud of him. She's a little happy that her her little bird has finally taken flight. Unfortunately, at this point, Karina sees Casey's passed out body on the floor of the interrogation room. She tells Morgan not to move, but Morgan gets knocked out by Amy and Gaia's as they're escaping. Gaia's comes in and pistol whips Karina, so she falls to the floor. This leaves Chuck and his suitcases. Chuck has just arrived in the Buy More, laden with bags. Um, and Sarah calls him to let him know that he is the last defense against Amy and Gaia's. He creeps around the buy more while on the phone with Sarah, trying to give her a little apology for all his meddling. They watch him on the security camera as he seems to be taking a bunch of those unwrapped DVDs that we're always commenting on at the buy more, opening them and then crushing them in a waffle iron. Apparently he's using them to make like throwing stars, which once Amy and Gaia's come up into the store, he flashes on throwing stars, and, like, there, I don't know if you broke a DVD, like, I'm sure that shit is sharp, but, like, it, like, sticks in the wall. Like, it, like, seems like an actual, like, brutal weapon. I thought this was ingenious, and one of the smartest things Chuck has ever done in a combat situation. It's really cool, and it's kind of, like, not really, like, I don't know. It's not like a big deal. Like he just kind of like does it. He doesn't like explain what he's doing. It's cool. He's a smart guy. There's no moment of panic where he's like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then like sees the DVDs and has like an idea. Like he just literally it's like second nature. Like he just is up there. He's going through the DVDs and then he gets a waffle maker and he just does it. I know. I honestly thought you were going to say there was like some sort of like bonus scene that we a declassified scene that we missed where he like 
had a conversation with Morgan at the beginning about like, wouldn't it be cool if we had throwing stars? Like, no, it's just like it <laughs> nope. happens. Yeah, it's true. Chuck is forced to fight Amy after flashing on fighting, and he makes the lovely line of, I don't like fighting girls. But fight a girl he does. Chuck knocks Amy down, and the cat squad finally managed to escape Castle. They come up to Gaia's and say, going somewhere, pussy? Back at Chuck's, Sarah and Zandra finally have a conversation, mending their wounds. Zandra agrees to attend Sarah's engagement party, and Sarah asks Karina and Zandra to be bridesmaids. Later, Chuck is trying to apologize to Sarah again, but instead of allowing him to apologize, Sarah thanks Chuck for all his behavior. She asks him to never stop helping her. <laughs> Even if she asks him to stop, don't stop, Chuck. You have to keep helping me. <laughs> so, that was... I'll, I'll have more to say on that later, but it was, it was a little bit... Uh... <laughs> At the engagement party... Alex shows up to break it off with Morgan. She says she doesn't feel like she fits into his world. She says she doesn't feel special, just lied to. As she's about to walk off, Morgan apologizes for not knowing how to handle his exes running into each other. He says it's a statistical anomaly, so he just didn't know how to deal with it. I guess that's fair enough. He's not really that mature of a guy, so he just kind of fucked up a little bit. But he says he would never do anything to threaten their relationship because he loves her and is in love with her. And apparently Alex is just, like, dropping the L-bomb, just, like, smooths everything over. Karina even comes over to apologize to Alex for meddling in her relationship with Morgan, and Alex is like, whatever, he loves me. I, I don't know, I feel for Alex, I feel like she has kind of a thankless role. She doesn't have a lot to do. It's a little bit, a little bit of a bummer. The other question I wanted to ask, um... We don't really see any other people living in this apartment complex. Nope. But do you think, like, other people are upset that, like, these two families are always throwing these massive raging parties in the courtyard? I would imagine. I yeah. was con I was confused because we did not see anyone from the Bymore <laughs> in this party. Like, there's I mean, no Fernando. True. Yeah. Uh, which is fine. That's Chuck's prerogative. But yeah. literally, we do not see anyone that we recognize. And we're like, and we know that Sarah doesn't have anyone at this party. So yeah. this is these are all people that Chuck knows. And we also know that Chuck doesn't really know people. Yeah. So my question is, who the fuck are these people? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, maybe they're the neighbors. Maybe this is us finally seeing the neighbors. My follow up question okay. is, where is Devin? Because he's not here at the party. Good question. Ellie is here. Devin yes. is not. The baby is not here. So maybe Devin's with the baby, but wouldn't the party be kind of loud for the baby? Like, it seems like the party's kind of extending into Devin and Ellie's. Well, here's my thought. Okay. And I don't think they convey this in the show. But what I am saying, what I'm telling myself is that Ellie and Devin brought the baby to Devin's parents. Okay. And then Ellie came back because she was going to go to the party. But Devin is staying with the baby and his parents so that Ellie can have a nice time at the party. That is really sweet. That is nice. My little concern about, like, the whole in-laws thing is, don't they live in Connecticut? Well, that's what I thought, too. But then we were talking, I, I couldn't remember because I was like, oh, Devin has this kind of, like, California vibe to him. Yeah. So I'm like, did they mm -hmm. move? Did they Were they originally from Connecticut and then they moved to California because Devin was there? I mean, that's possible. Because they said they were just doing an overnight. Why would they... They wouldn't fly a would they fly a baby to Connecticut overnight? That would be insane. Maybe the parents were staying in a hotel and they the baby is in the hotel with them. Where is this baby? <laughs> Where's the baby? Also, <laughs> speaking of people, where is Mary? Oh my god, that's a great question. I didn't even think of that. She like went back to the spy life, I guess. She Chuck was struggling to have her be a part of his life this entire time. She's now back in their life and he's not she's not at the party. But not only is she not at the party, Chuck does not care that she's not at the party. There's no like him sitting by the fountain and being like, geez, I'm just upset that my mom couldn't be here. He like does not give a shit that she's not there and she has no reason not to be there. It's one of those things where like once you get over the hump in your own mind, it like doesn't matter anymore. So Chuck was like sad his mom wasn't there. But once she was there, he's like, I don't. I don't care. It's fine. <laughs> so the episode ends with another um, kind of passing the Bechdel test. I don't I don't really know if this one counts as much as the first one. Sarah and Ellie talk to each other about Chuck's attempts to help Sarah. Sarah says the one thing she isn't sure Chuck can help her with is her family because 
it's complicated. She says she doesn't know where her dad is. She doesn't have a good relationship with her mom. Ellie offers to help before they bring Chuck in. And Sarah asks Ellie to be her maid of honor. Isn't that nice? It is nice. It's a nice moment. The episode closes out with another narration um, over Sarah and Ellie hugging, where the uh, whoever the Charlie's Angel, I guess the Charlie type figure is like, maybe the Cat Squad's going to have another member or whatever. And like, this is kind of weird because like, that was in Morgan's head, and Morgan is nowhere to be seen in this scene. Like, it's Chuck looking at his sister and his girlfriend hugging. So I don't know what that's all about. It was, it's like kind of a cute moment, but if you, um, if you think about it at all, it's a little confusing. Maybe if it's Morgan's fantasy, maybe he's with Alex, and he's thinking that Alex maybe could someday be initiated into the cat squad, and that happens to overlap with Chuck looking at Sarah and Ellie. Yeah, okay, sure, I'll take it. That That's a better explanation than anything I could come up with. We would, uh, it seems like we would really need the intersect in our heads to be able to make all of these mental gymnastics that we're <laughs> currently going through for this episode. Yes, sure. So now we have Chuck, Mary Kill, uh, where we take one part of this episode that we'd like to marry uh, following a lengthy, massive block party style engagement party. Uh, and then another part of this episode that we'd like to kill. Aaron, what would you like to marry? So, uh, just going right back to a couple seconds ago, I really liked Sarah choosing Ellie as her maid of honor. It was reminiscent of when Ellie chooses Sarah as one of her bridesmaids. Is uh, is actually Sarah Ellie's maid of honor? Do you remember? Was she just a bridesmaid? I think she was a bridesmaid, but who was Ellie's ma maid of honor? Was it just like some random person? Potentially. Maybe Sarah okay. was the maid of honor. I don't, maybe she I don't had know. one. I don't know. It's a different a different lifetime ago. Yeah, I know. But I just thought this was a really sweet moment um, of connection between them. I really just liked seeing both of them like have plot lines with one another and just like as individual women with initiative. Like I like them coming together to like solve problems together and like that Sarah has another outlet in her life and that like their relationship doesn't just extend to like she is Ellie's brother's girlfriend. Like now they are friends in their own right. And I thought mm. it was a really sweet moment. And I was really happy for Sarah that she has that. Now she has three friends when she didn't have any before. Uh, and Chuck uh, only has, it seems like 500 based off yeah. of the mm -hmm. guest yeah, list. Yeah, he the has party. just so many friends. Right. In, in like those contests where they say, like, you and 500 of your closest friends. And you're like, who would I even invite? Like Chuck has the people. These people. Yeah. Uh, maybe he just went to the. Uh, the club in Rio de Janeiro and said, hey, after party at my place, everyone. After party in L.A. And every, he flew all of them up. Yeah, well, the CIA seems to have unlimited resources for, like, flying people to places very quickly. So maybe. True. All right, what about you? Um, I think I want to marry um, Minnie Arden's performance this week. Which which one was she? Karina. Okay. Um, Minnie? Her name is Minnie, right? I think you're right. She's Swedish, right? Right. Yeah. But the past times we've seen her, uh, Karina, I found Karina to be annoying, but I was mm -hmm. kind of happy I get to see her again this week. Mm -hmm. I thought that... Yeah, it's been a little while. Um, Minnie Arden does a good job of being this kind of sexy, instigating woman who wants to torture Morgan. I thought uh -huh. something that we didn't mention at all, but I thought was very funny was that she keeps referring to Morgan as Martin. Oh, and yeah. And then yeah. at some point refers to him as Marty. Yeah. Um, which I just got... That's cute. I thought was very funny that she doesn't even know his name. Um, yeah. I'm not saying I support this kind of like, I guess, what is borderline sexual harassment, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, especially in the workplace. Yeah. Um, but I think she really hit the nail on the head in terms of the kind of person that would do this and kind of mm -hmm. like get off to this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I thought it was fun having her around in a different capacity than we've mm -hmm. seen her before and her being stuck in Castle with Morgan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. OK, so moving on to kill. Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I mean, I will also rewind it to a couple seconds ago. What is this party? Well, who are these? <laughs> like, I, when they kept talking about the engagement party, I was like, oh, you know, it's going to be the core cast and they're going to have mm -hmm. like a small thing and it's going to mm -hmm. be, you know, maybe Big Mike will be there, Jeff and Lester, or, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? And don't get me wrong. Like, I think Chuck and Sarah deserve a nice big engagement party, but it just felt so inconsistent with what we know about the rest of the show. Yeah. It just, I was like, what is going on? Like, who are these people? Um. That's so. totally fair. It's like not something I thought about while watching it. I was just like, yes, this is what engagement parties are. But like now that you point it out, it is kind of weird that we don't like see any of the cast there. Like 
it's I guess just a uh, it's a trope because I was also like I watched this earlier in the day and then I was watching New Girl Mm -hmm. later that day. And Mm -hmm. it was also they had an engagement party in that episode, too, Mm -hmm. or was a similar thing where it's like you see the core cast the entire time. They don't really have any outside friends besides the cast of the show. And then Mm -hmm. there's a party that has seemingly hundreds of people in it and you're like <laughs> how did they have what is this and then at the party the core cast isn't talking to anyone besides the core cast well you know that's i guess neither of us have i mean you can tell me if i'm wrong but neither of us have ever had an engagement party for ourselves so maybe it's just like people come out of the woodwork they just appear <laughs> there i guess so it seems kind of weird though because a lot of times i think that you know weddings are expensive so you're trying to uh-huh. save money why would uh-huh. you blow all this money on a pre-wedding Party. I mean that's a good point. Yeah, hmm. who knows? So, I would, I would, I wish they handled that differently. But yeah, um, speaking of things we wish they handled differently, my kill is just like I don't have any direct problems with how like Alex acted this week. Like that plot line wasn't as bad as it could have been. And Are it you was trying to kill Alex? Funny. I'm not trying to kill Alex. I'm trying to kill how they're using Alex. Oh, okay. I just think it's like. I don't know. She's a really cool character. I like the idea of, like, Casey's daughter and, like, the little kind of threat of, like, if Morgan breaks her heart, Casey's gonna come after him. Like, that's kind of funny. It kind of brings Casey and Morgan together. But, like, Casey and Alex, I just feel like she's only in episodes where her role is to do something like this, where she's, like, a little bit jealous or, like, Morgan is acting weird to her. Like, she's never really had, like... I believe she is a cool character and does cool stuff. Like, she's a student. She's, like, studying law or whatever. But, like, we don't really see her do anything other than, like, maybe her and Morgan's relationship is being threatened. Maybe she's breaking up with him. Like, she's hurt because she's not getting enough attention. Like, it was just, like, kind of a bummer. Yeah. I mean, seeing as it just it took them until uh, this episode to potentially pass the Bechdel test with the two main female characters. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I guess Alex will probably have her own plot line, I guess, in uh, roughly four more seasons. Yeah, perfect. So I'm sure we'll get there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's kind of like she doesn't really she just kind of exists as Morgan's person. So, yeah. I, I think that someday this will be on the same level as the Bechdel test. I think the scooter <laughs> scale, uh, where we, <laughs> we rate an episode of Chuck based on a scale of zero to five corn dogs in memory of the Wienerlicious, I think they'll have the same kind of level of like cultural impact, right? Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. Like the co- students in college will someday be writing about the implications of the scooter scale and how it applies to other shows. Someone that we went to college with will one day have a podcast called The Scooter Cast, and we won't be jealous at all of her popularity. Is that something I should know about? Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, so, Aaron, how many corn dogs would you like to give this episode? I'm going to give this episode a 3.5. I thought that the um, enjoyment I got out of the Cat Squad as a concept was enough to carry me through all of the various problems. I agree that, like, Amy being the villain was, like, not even heavily telegraphed. It just wasn't the surprise that they treated it like. Mm -hmm. I had problems with Alex. I had, like, I like the idea that Casey was, like, upset and, like, hugely affected by not being able to talk to Kathleen anymore. But they don't really do a ton with that other than that scene. Um, And my biggest problem is just, like, the idea of that, like, Chuck learns a lesson that I thought was a really mature, good lesson of, like, not trying to solve every problem. Like, he's a good guy and he wants to help Sarah, but maybe there are some things that he needs to just, like, she just needs him to listen. She doesn't need him to fix it. But then, like, that that lesson is just revoked. Sarah is just like, yes, please keep doing what you're doing. And I thought that was, like, really disappointing. Mm-hmm. So, um, I maybe would have given this a higher score if not for those things. But the things I liked about it were just like, I liked the opening. I liked the closing. I liked the moment between Ellie and Sarah. I agree that Karina's performance was good. And I even liked the other cats. Um, It was kind of like a Sarah centric episode. So that was kind of cool, but just like the, mainly the problems with Chuck and Alex were just like a little bit bringing it down for me. Mm -hmm. What about you? I would agree. I, I would give it a three out of five. Okay. Um, I think I, I, I 
uh, would probably give it maybe like a 3.5, but I, I guess I don't hate the idea of this episode. I think that the episode does have some strong parts, but overall, I just feel like it was kind of boring because mm-hmm. it, it might be because I remembered the twist of the episode within like the first 10 minutes of them introducing the cat squad. I was like, uh-huh. oh, it's the one that we're not supposed to think it is. Yeah. So that kind of deflated the tension for me. Um, mm-hmm. But other than, I mean, I still think the cat squad thing seemed kind of to be like one note for me. They didn't yeah. really explore the characters like Sarah's skeptical. Zandra is angry. Amy is yeah. the, the Trojan horse and Karina is basically just Karina. Um, I did enjoy, like I said, the Morgan and Karina plot line. I appreciated mm-hmm. how it tied into Morgan and Alex's relationship. I do have some questions, obviously, about the party uh, <laughs> and why exactly Chuck had to bring all of his luggage back to the buy more. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, we had some good, you know, brief action sequences like the DVD mm-hmm. throwing stars and uh, uh-huh. the sexy Sarah showdown. Mm-hmm. Um, Chuck hanging like a pinata with the shooting mm-hmm. of things was cool. That was cool. Yep. Um, I'm always happy with, you know, Sarah forward episodes, but I found the campiness of the cat squad and the uh, Charles Charlie's Angels references to be kind of heavy handed and a wee bit stale. Fair enough. So now we have the lesson of the week. Erin, what did you learn this week? I learned that men must solve women's problems, even when the women tell them not to, because they will be thanked for it. Wow. Okay. Was So I, that's something you want me to play like more of an active role in solving problems in your life? Is that yeah, what I mean, I'm hearing? I, this episode told me that I will be happy if you do that. So please feel free. OK, well, maybe after this is done, can you send me like a spreadsheet of all of the problems that you have? And I will I'll work on them. Get yeah, actually, I have of. one right here. So I'll just uh, I'll just get okay. it to you as soon as the episode's done. Perfect. Sounds good. Happy to uh, to help. Thanks. That was the <laughs> the most heavily handed sarcasm I think we've <laughs> ever exhibited on this show. Um my lesson of the week was uh, this week. I learned that I am way more attracted to Karina than I previously thought. <laughs> I, I think I had a little bit of a crush going on. It might have been the cane. I'm not sure. Which. OK. Is, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it was the cane. I'm hoping it wasn't the cane. Maybe it was. I don't know. But well, I that's was, very cool of you. I guess so. I don't know. Before I was like, hey, Karina. But this time I was like, oh, hello. Oh, Karina. Hello. I was like, oh, is Do this you want to talk about, like, we didn't really talk about their dresses in the carnival scene, but I thought they were, I really liked Sarah's. It was kind of, it kind of looked like something I would have worn to a semi-formal dance in middle school. Like, it was kind of, like, tight on top and then, like, frilly on the bottom. The mm-hmm. other ones were, like, wearing, they were all wearing white, and they were wearing, like, kind of tight dresses, but Sarah's, like, looked, like, pretty demure, I would say. Just, you know, just saying that. Karina wasn't wearing a dress. Maybe that's why you liked her. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I was just like, is this how Aaron feels when Volkov's on the screen? I don't I don't understand. <laughs> Finally, you do understand. <laughs> I don't think anything anyone will ever understand your relationship to Volkov. I know. Uh, I hope he's in the next episode. I miss uh, him. <laughs> so uh, we're going to wrap things up. Aaron, I wanted to give you one last chance to address the issue at the beginning of this episode. Uh, you got very defensive last time we tried talking about this, but was that Archie making the cat noises or was that you making the cat noises? Final offer. Okay, I think that we should finally put this to bed. Yeah. I think that we should maybe, um, I don't know. I I want us to move into the future. I want uh-huh. us to not go to bed angry. I right. want us to not finish this podcast angry. Right. Um, the entity that was making those noises was actually the sweet one, Amy. She was here all along. Amy, it couldn't have been her. It was. Ah. Uh. She's Damn right it. here. She's she, she can't talk, but she's making uh, she's making faces at you. To be fair, I did. Uh, I mean, I, I assumed she was there. I was going to say I saw her sitting behind you. But as I established earlier, I don't actually look at you when we record. Yeah, I look mm-hmm. at the wall and just kind of mm-hmm. talk to you yeah. like we're on the mm-hmm. phone. Um, but Amy, maybe it was you know Amy what? all along. I'm starting to think that maybe Amy's the bitch. <laughs> You're right. What do you think <laughs> happened to her? Do you think she's in prison with Nicole Richie? Do you think they were planning a spinoff with her and uh Steve Austin <laughs> with Nicole Richie, Amy and St- Stone Cold Steve Austin. Perfect. I would watch that. Uh, yeah, that sounds like it would be pretty. Uh, I mean, actually, um, I'm going to head out and write, write a spec script. So I'll huh. see you. Typical, uh, typical Angelino going to Starbucks <laughs> to write a spec script. Yep. Uh, OK, well, uh, I will be signing off. This is Chris Gillespie reminding you that food like Karina is sexy. Oh, boy. Um, This is Aaron Arata letting you know that anything is possible. That's right. 
Meow. Oh, meow. Swear to God. Swear to God. Meow. Thanks for listening. As always, a big thanks to the artist Hadakoa and the fine folks at freemusicarchive.org for providing us with our theme song, Warm Up. If you want to drop us a line, you can reach us at gocheckyourselfpodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Go Check Yourself on your preferred podcast platform. New episodes come out every Monday morning and you do not want to miss a new episode. Thanks again. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.